Our Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time thanking you for this day, thanking you for the opportunity that we have to be able to assemble together, both in person and online during these times. We're thankful, Father, for our health. We're thankful that there are measures that we can take to keep our families and our individual lives safe during these times. And we pray, Father, that as we live, we will recognize that no matter what takes place in this world, that we can depend on you, that we can know that our best interest is at hand, that we can know that this life is just temporary as it was designed, and that we can know with all assurance, more than anything else inside of this world, that one day we can spend eternity with you, Father. We come to you this time with a very special prayer on those that we know. We pray for Pam Pig as she is in the hospital, as she's had one procedure, and as she will have another this upcoming week. We pray, Father, that as that has been scheduled, it will be able to take place as scheduled, and that it will be a success as they expect and hope it will be. And we pray as they treat her with that pacemaker and with medication, with the other issues that she's having with her heart, that all things will continue to be good and that they will be just as they expect them to be. We pray, Father, for the family of Bill Jennings and the passing of his mother. We know, Father, for some weeks they've been surrounded by her, and we pray, Father, for their comfort at this very difficult time. We pray for the family of Donald Oates and the passing of his mother, and we pray, Father, for that entire family, as even though they have been separated from her from different states and not allowed to see her due to the current situation of life, that they will have encouragement and that they will be comforted as well. We pray, Father, for Dwayne Rost as he is expecting and looking forward to celebrating his 100th birthday. We pray, Father, that his celebration will be a huge success and that he will be encouraged and that he will continue to have a good degree of help as he continues in this life. We're so thankful, Father, for our lives. Thankful that this morning we have them. Thankful that we have the opportunity to be here. And thankful, Father, for your word. Your word is that which encourages us. It's what directs us in this life, and we pray that we, as individuals, as families, and as a group of your people, that we will, to a greater degree in our lives from this point pressing forward, depend on your word more and more so that we may be the people that you would have us to be, so that we may reach the world as it is your command to us, and Father, so that we may live that others may see you. May we do that more and more. May we depend on your word as those groups. May we also, Father, as we are here this morning as a nation of people in this world, may we as a nation turn to you more and more. May we look at our world and look at the current situation of our entire world, whether it be the political climate, the health crisis that's going on through the world, or all of the other variety of issues that exist. May we recognize that we have the opportunity to help and not to hurt. And may we do that more and more in our lives, not only as a nation, but also as individuals. We're so thankful, Father, that we have this time. Thankful for prayer, knowing that you hear us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we are in the middle of a series on Sunday mornings in our 930 class, spending time looking at items having to do with the church and this Sunday, as we gather together, we're going to be looking at what unites the church. And over about the next three weeks, as we bring this series on the church to a close, and you may already notice this as well, but you will look on the front of the bulletin, and there will be a chart there for the next few weeks that will help you go through our entire class, just give you an extra way to keep up as we're in class, and that will help us as we go through. But today, what we want to do is we want to look at some things that will help us be united together. You know, the greatest problem among any nation, among any groups of people, among any marriage or any groups of parents, is division. Now, I would suggest to you, as I think you would suggest as well, is our world is currently divided. Wouldn't you agree? Our nation is divided, wouldn't you agree? I think so. Maybe I'll say this and maybe it's out of turn. I hope it's not, but maybe now more than ever are we divided in our lifetimes. But does it have to be that way for the church? Does the church of necessity need to be divided? 
Does the church in any reason need to be divided? I suggest to you the answer is no. And thus, for just a few moments, let's look at ten different things this morning that help unite the church. Now, let's ask this question before we look at the ten things. What is the church? If someone asks you the question, what is the church, how would you describe it? It's the body, okay, that's a good definition, the body of Christ. How else would you describe it? The called out, okay, how else would you describe it? The people. May it always be our first definition of the church. What is the church? It's the people. It's the people. So what does that say to us as individuals who are a part of the church? What is the church? Well, if we say this all individually, we are the church. Or, as an individual, I am the church. So what unites us? What brings us together And there is the list that we will look at today. Number one, we're going to notice that we are brought together, we are united together in a Savior that we can serve. Number two, we're going to recognize the thing that unites the church is a book that we can believe. Number three, we're going to recognize and illustrate to ourselves that there is a gospel that we can give. Number four, we're going to see that there is a cross that we can carry. Number five, we're going to see that we are living in a race that we can run. Number six, we're going to see a way that we can walk. Number seven, we're going to see a course that we can complete. Number eight, we're going to see a faith that we can follow. Number nine is going to be an interesting one, a look that we can live. And then number ten, we're going to notice a crown that we can capture. And all of these ten things are the things that unite the church. Now, this list also is not exclusive. These are not the only ten things that unite the church, but these are ten things that you and I can put into our everyday present lives and truly make a difference as we join together. Join with me this morning as we begin in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and let's notice a Savior that we can serve. This is Acts 20, verse 19. And it reads this way as you go to Acts chapter 20, verse 19. It reads, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Now, who was verbally expressing this? Who was saying this in Acts 20, verse 19? Who was this? Was it Peter? Luke? It's Paul. Okay, what do we know about Paul? Paul. Well, let's, let's think about Paul for just a minute to see a Savior that we can serve. What do we know about Paul? Well, what was his other name? Yeah, He used to be Saul. Now, what do we know about Saul? He was a persecutor. Now, here's the difference. This is what I want you to see. We have Saul, who is a persecutor of the church. We have Saul, who is against Jesus Christ. We have Saul, who is trying to tear down everything that we read about in the New Testament. Then we have Paul on the other hand, don't we? What do we know about Paul? Well, we know that if you put him in prison, he'll write most of the New Testament. You know that if we put him in prison, he's going to convert the jailers. You know if you put him in prison, he's going to convert a runaway slave and run him home. Do you see a difference in those two? Now, do you recognize a Savior that we can serve? Paul is writing this now saying that he is serving the Lord. And he's trying to do so with all humility because that's not how he used to serve. Imagine him as Saul. He was taught in the greatest schools of his land. He had the highest people and authority behind him. He was able to do anything they wanted and anything he wanted without repercussion. By the world's standards, he had it made. And he could walk around and say, I'm Saul. And that meant something, didn't it? Remember when he was converted, the disciples were scared of Saul because they knew who he was. I'm not saying it was right for them to turn away from him at that time, but they knew who he was. Your name and our names mean something, don't they? Now we have Paul. He's serving in all humility. He's not living like that anymore. In this lowliness and humbleness of mind, 
And look at what he says about himself. With many tears. I would suggest to you that we can connect the tears of Paul to the prayers of Paul. Because how many times do you read in the writings of Paul that he's praying for you always? Always making mention of you in his prayers. Always concerned about his sons in the faith, his, his family in the faith. And I would suggest to you that connected that is many tears. His labor was worthy. But we read about Paul. Have you ever been tempted? What's the song that we sing about the word Temptation. Tempted and tried, we're off led to wonder. Now, I've often wondered if that writer was saying we wander about as we wonder about all these things. You don't think about Paul very often, but Paul was tempted. But he had a Savior that he could serve. And by the way, we read about it in Acts chapter 20, verse 19, that in this current situation, there was the lying in wait of the Jews to entrap him. Now just imagine this for a moment. See it from the eyes of Paul, but also see it from the eyes of Saul. Saul found a Savior that he could serve, and Paul never left the Savior that he did serve. Let me tell you, here's one thing that will unite the church. When we no longer serve the world, when we no longer serve self, and we find a way to unite in serving the Savior. But there's a word found in Acts 20, 19, with humility. Number one, when we try to unite the church, we're going to serve the Savior. Number two, as we strive to unite the church, we need to find a book that we can believe. And I want you to go with me to the book of Jude. I want you to see a phrase here. In the book of Jude, it's, it's a phrase that you've read before. It's a phrase that you know, but I, I just want you to see something. Because he's going to preface it with a statement over here, but he's going to leave a statement kind of hanging out in the middle. But that's quite impressive there toward the end. If we read in Jude 1 verse 3, we read this, Beloved, I want you to see that word beloved. Uh, this is a very impressive word in the New Testament. We don't give it its degree. But, but it's a word that means to the writer and to the reader, I want to bring you in close and I want to tell you something so important because your soul depends on it. It's that caring language that's used in the New Testament. That's this word beloved. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Put a period there. Number one, he was going to write about the common salvation. Now, we need to know something about this. Salvation is not uncommon. If it was uncommon, very few people would have it. Very few people would be able to hear about it. Very few people would be able to understand it. But he was going to write to them about the common salvation. That means you and I can have it. You and I can hear about it and tell it. Other people can know about it. He says, I was going to write about that. He said, but there was something more important that came up. He said, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Now listen to this. That was once delivered unto the saints. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a book that we can believe. I want to ask you a question. It's a very important question for us. Number one, here it is. How can we contend for the faith? Maybe to answer that, we need to understand what it means to contend for the faith. What does it mean to contend for the faith? Anybody have a definition of that? Keep on, Keep on keeping on. You're right. You're right. It can be in our personal lives. You and I must contend in the faith in our personal lives. And what does that mean? Keep on keeping on. I've got to be who I profess to be. We profess to be Christians, right? Well, let's contend for the faith in our personal lives. How else do you contend for the faith? Stand up for the truth. All right, so here, here, here we've got it. How do I do either of those things, whether it's this standing up for the truth in some public manner or even a private matter in our own lives? How do you do that? How do you do that? We live in 2020. We're an advanced society. How, how do you do that? Yeah, that's right. That, that, can, that can be. But how do you do it?
which was once delivered unto the saints. He gives us what he's going to tell them to do, which was to contend for the faith. And he gives them the answer of how to contend for the faith. Now, I know there are a lot of ups and downs in contending for the faith. I know that contending for the faith sometimes can be seen as controversial. Isn't that true? It can be, can it? I know that sometimes contending for the faith can be seen as maybe mean or hard-hearted. I know that contending for the faith sometimes in our road is going, or in our own lives, is going to lead us, lead us to the road that is at a crossroad where we have to make decisions. Have you ever had to make decisions that were based on maybe a fork in the road or a crossroad? How did you make those decisions in your personal life? The church is the same way, folks. We are the same way because you and I can be united together when we recognize that there is a book that we can believe. Let's take some of our national problems in this world, specifically in this country, and let's come up with an answer. Let's talk about abortion for just a moment. How do we determine whether we are for or against abortion? Boy, that's a weird question to ask. How do you determine that? Now step out of the world for just a minute and step into the book for just a minute. How do you determine right or wrong? How do I know that abortion is wrong? Not based on the world. God's Word. That means somewhere I've got to find that God respects life. Somewhere I've got to find that God respects the innocent. We can find that in Scripture. Let's talk about the current movement in our world of destroying the biblical home. How do I know, ladies and gentlemen, that the biblical home is one man, one woman for life? By the way, let me just give you this information if you don't know it. The LGBTQ culture is seeking to destroy the biblical home. There are other organizations in our current climate that are designed to destroy the biblical home. How do I know that I must oppose any organization that seeks to destroy the biblical home? Step out of the world a minute and step into the Word for a minute. How do I know that? Somebody give me a passage that tells me both out of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Just give me the book. How do I know? Genesis. All right, what do we know in Genesis? Genesis. God made man and woman. God put them together, and it was for how long? Life. Let's go to the New Testament. How do I know from the New Testament, from a book that I can believe of worldly problems, how I need to position myself? What book? Romans 1 is a good one. Boy, I wouldn't even think about Romans 1. Turning the natural use around of the world. How about that? I was thinking of Matthew, weren't you, some of you others? But Romans 1, probably a more, more crucial book in that very idea because it almost describes chapter 1, our current world climate. You're right, Ephesians chapter 5 describes this very same idea. By the way, I want to mention this. Go with me to Romans 1. I want you to see something. I'm glad you brought this up. Romans 1. All right, I want you to read with me verse 32. Romans 1, 32. We're talking about a book that we can believe. Let's find something that we can believe inside of this book. Romans 132, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, now listen to this last phrase, but have pleasure in them that do them. Folks, Romans 132, we cannot support those in sin. That, that's confusing to me. <laughs> now, I, I, I don't mean this to be flippant, okay? But there are medical procedures that a man will never need. Now, abortion is not a medical procedure. Let me correct that thought. But there are medical procedures that men will never need. 
By the way, back to Romans chapter 1, turning the natural use around, men for men, women for women, if you'll read in the middle of those chapters. But you and I can recognize that we have a book that we can believe. And if we want to be united together in this life, here's the answer. What unites the church? Well, a book that we can believe. What unites the church? Number three, a gospel that we can give. This comes from Acts chapter 18, verse 18. It reads this way, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Folks, I want you to think of a day. It's a very important day. By the way, it was the most important day of your life. It's not your birth. It's not your children's birth. It was not the day that you were married. What is the most important day of the life of a Christian? All right. Now, I want you to transport your minds from this time. Now, now I wasn't baptized here, and some of you were not either, but I want you to get into that water again. I want you to think about it. I want you to kind of remember, because I don't know about you, but I can still see that, can't you? I know where I was. I know who was beside me. I know who was in front of me. Now, I want you to think about something. How did you get to that point? How did we get to that point? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You and I, ladies and gentlemen, Acts 18, verse 8, have a gospel that we can give. How did Crispus and his entire household know that they needed to be immersed? Well, someone gave the gospel. I believe there are three different areas of which you and I as Christians can give the gospel. I'm going to start off with what I believe to be the most crucial. You and I need to give ourselves the gospel. You need to teach yourself. You need to teach yourself. Now, now, now that is more than just reading the Bible at home, okay? It's understanding it. You need to teach yourself. You, you find a word that you don't know what means. How do you find the answer to that word? How do you do that? Look it up. How hard is that in the world that we live in today? Not hard, huh? Strong's Concordance. I know I don't use mine as much anymore in paper form than I used to. But how many of you in this room have a Strong's Concordance at home? Look it up. How many of you have something like this? I use an app called Blue Letter Bible. It's the one I like the most. And you can tap on the verse. You can hit interlinear and concordance. And you can look up any word and see where it's used all throughout Scripture. And you can determine what that word means by how it is used. That's the beauty of Strong's. Now, I don't suggest that you always depend on the definition that Strong's is going to give. But you look up that original word and see how it's used in its context. And you'll know what it means. We've got to teach ourselves. Number two, we've got to teach our families. Now, you can't do number two if you've not taught yourself. You cannot teach what you do not know. It will never happen. We've got to, number two, teach our families. What would be the greatest disaster in this life? Think about it. What we've seen disasters in this life. 2020 has been filled with them. But what would be the greatest disaster when all of our lives are over, we look back and say, that was the biggest disaster of my life. What would it be? To be lost. But, but I want to I take it a little bit further. To lead your family to be lost. That's the greatest disaster that you and I can face. I, I'm experiencing this right now, and uh, I don't know what to think about it yet. I'll tell you one day later. I've got two boys at home, one sick this morning, that's why they're not here. But here's what I know about those two boys one of them is five. That means how many more years do I have him in this home? 13. If things go normal. Okay, that's not long enough. 
How many of you have said, you'll blink your eye and it'll be gone? I feel like I'm at a half blink. 13 years is nothing, isn't it? And that's all we have. Now, I know that as children grow up and as they leave the home, we are still to be the influencers, the role models, the teachers of this life. But boy, when you have them in the home, in the palm of your hand, that's where it's crucial, isn't it? What are we teaching our children about Jesus? What are, our, what are we teaching our children about the church? Well, let me tell you, I've learned this lesson harder than anything. Your children will do exactly what you do. You put the church down, so will they. You put other Christians down, so will they. You live like the world, nobody else may know it, but they will. We, we try to teach our sons not to say certain words. And when they hear them, we'll, we'll tell them, you know, here's why we don't want you saying that word. Well, I hauled off and said, that's S-T-U-P-I-D one day. We just, you know, we had just been over this. Dad. <sighs> Thirteen years left. We've got to teach our children. And number three, we teach ourselves, we teach our children. I've got to teach others. That's Acts 18, 8, being in existence. That's matter of fact, the book of Acts is all about teaching others. Understand what you read. Who was that said to? Who was that, who, who was that said to? If you don't know, look it up. Before you go to bed today, find out who that was read, read, said to. The eunuch. I'll help you out. You find it. Find it in Scripture. I know I said it a little bit different than it was inside of the King James language, but, but look it up and find it. Because let me tell you, every one of us can say, you need a little help with that. You know what? Understand what you read saying. You need a little help with that. All right, let's take a test. You ready? No pencils, no paper required. We're going to take a test. We're going to take two of them, Okay. These are very important tests, okay? Number one, let's take a test about worship. You, 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 you answer this to yourself. Can you show someone the five acts of worship in Scripture right now? Either I can or I cannot. Now, depending on how we answer that personally, let, let's make some improvements. Let's teach ourselves. Let's ask the most important one, though. That was just a warm-up test. Can you show someone inside of Scripture without looking at that blue banner how to become a Christian? Remember what Romans 10, 17 says? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of who? So can you show someone how to become a Christian with the Bible? Teach ourselves, teach our children, teach others. We can be united together because there is a gospel that we can give. Now, we've got to pick up the pace because we've been lollygagging. Now, let's get on. Okay, ready? Here is number four, I believe. You follow me down and count it out if I'm wrong. We can be united together in a cross that we can carry. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. This is talking about Jesus. This is helping us understand his life. This also connects us into the book of Luke where we are told to pick up our cross and follow it daily. But 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Oh, what a gospel we can give. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Folks, we've never had it easier according to the Scriptures. And let me tell you, you and I can look at the life of Jesus and we can emulate that. No, you're not going to go to a literal cross to die for the world. I pray that we never see another cross in that manner. I want you to make this real in your life for just a minute, but, but did you know that those who wrote the New Testament died for it? Some were banished to islands to live alone for the rest of their days. Some were put in prison until their deaths. Some were beheaded. I want you to think about the first century Christians. I want you to think about the Roman road that was lit 
by those who profess to be Christians. Dipped in tar and lit a, lit a fire. How easy do we have it? What cross are you carrying today? Well, somebody called me a Campbellite, and I just don't know what to do. I know words hurt. But you know what? We have never lived in a less persecuted time as a Christian. Now, it may be coming. I hope not. But if it does, will we still live as a Christian? Will we still carry that cross? Because no matter what happens, Jesus still died. He still went to the tomb. And then according to the scriptures, he rose again. That's never going to change. And that, ladies and gentlemen, can unite us together. There is a higher purpose in this life than just going to the office to the grave. We are to go from the one that gave us our life to the one that gave us our life. Let's go from eternity to eternity. And that's a cross that we can bear and carry if we will unite ourselves together. In the middle of our lesson, we can be united together in a race that we can run. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. It's a beautiful segment of Scripture right here, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. We're specifically going to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. But by the way, verse 2 says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's Jesus. You're the joy, folks. Let's see a race that we can run. Verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which has so easily beset us. Now listen to what he's about to say. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Where are you going? Where are you running? Because there is a race that we can run. Here's a question. Are you running? The Christian race is an endurance race. You don't have to sprint the whole time. But you've got to make it to the end. That's something, folks, that can unite us together. When you became a Christian, when we became Christians... We started an endurance race. Who are your two greatest enemies? There are two, by the way. We don't like to think about one. What's the, what's the number one greatest enemy that you have? Who's the number one greatest enemy you have? Uh, who, who, who'd we say? The devil, Satan, the tempter. All right, everybody agree on that? Anybody disagree? That's the number one, number one enemy you've got. All right, this is where we're going to have a problem. Who's the number two enemy you have? ourselves we're all running that race who's gonna make a stop we are don't give the devil that credit he doesn't deserve it who's gonna stop you who's gonna make you get weak and start walking it's an endurance race you got to keep going Sometimes we walk as Christians. Sometimes we sit down as Christians. Sometimes we sprint. And usually when we sprint, we're like Jonah who ran ahead of God. It's an endurance race. And guess what? This is the best thing about it. We, we, we've not mentioned this. It's twofold. There are people supporting us in this race. Look at Hebrews 12.1. We see this, we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What is that? What is this cloud of witnesses? Those that are faithful before us. There's this concept of the heavenly realm who is rooting for us. Why? Because they did it. And here's the concept from Hebrews 12, 1. Their thinking is, if, if we could, you can. I guess that's why we read inside of scriptures that when we repent, the angels in heaven rejoice. There's all of these people, and even the angelic beings, who are on our side. But that's in the heavenly realm. Let's bring it back down to earth. Who is also on our side? You're right. 
You're right. But get, get, to, get to the earth. Take, take it to the depths of the earth. Who's on our side? Now somebody's going to get this. Who's on our side? You're right. Christ is right. God is right. Yep, yep, you're right. We are. We are. Who's supposed to be in heaven? We are. We make it there by our own decisions and choices, by the way. Yes, I know we depend on Christ, and without Christ we can't be there. But he's not going to make that decision for us, is he? When we make it to heaven, if we make it to heaven, who's going to be rooting for those behind us? We are. Therefore, in the church, the heaven on the earth, what should we be doing right now? We should be uniting together in a race that we can run. There are people who have gone on before us who do the same thing. Next, in what unites the church, I want you to recognize a way that we can walk. This comes from 1 Peter. This is probably one of my favorite passages out of 1 Peter because of who it talks about. A lot of people talked about it in 1 and 2 Peter. And it talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse, or 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. The very first phrase is about that we are called. Now we're called by the gospel and we're called by Christ. Read what he says, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. There is a way, folks, that we can walk. There is a life that we can live. There is something that we can be. It's a Christ follower. It's a Christian. By the way, just another pop quiz. Where were they first called Christians in the New Testament? Antioch, good. Let me ask you this. Let's blur that idea together. They're first called Christians in Antioch. What do they call us here? What do they call us here? I hope it's Christian. But we determine that based on 1 Peter 2.21, the example that we follow. So who are you following? Who, who are you walking after? You know the old story that's been told of the father who's walking down the beach and the son who is stepping in his footsteps. You, you, you've heard the song, and its name has currently uh, left me, but the concept of the song is the son's doing everything the father is doing, and the father's asking the son, why did you say that? And he said, because I heard you do it. Are we following Jesus today? He showed us. He's left us the example. He suffered for us. By the way, I think 1 Peter 2.21 gives us a direct indication of the life of a Christian. What is probably one of the things that a Christian will endure in this life? Take it from 1 Peter 2.21. Pick a word. You may have to change the end of the word. Suffering. Suffering. Suffer. The life of a Christian is not the most glamorous life that's ever been out there. In the world standards. Is it? It's not. We may never do the things the world does. We may never live the way the world lives, but ladies and gentlemen, we can walk in the way that Jesus walks. Next, in the things that unite the church, we have a course that we complete. This is 2 Timothy 4, 7. Paul says, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Folks, we're, we're, we're going somewhere Will you make it to the end? I, by the way, I find 2 Timothy 4, 7 to be one of the most interesting passages in the New Testament based on this. Paul doesn't say, I will finish. I have finished. It is finished. I'm going to, I want to, I hope to. He says, I have. What's that indicate to you and I? He has zero question in where he's going to spend eternity. 
begs me to ask this question as we're running out of time. Where will we spend eternity? Number next from Colossians 1.23. You and I have a faith that we can follow. This is probably a very interesting verse for our morning. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Pause there. Grounded and settled. Where? In the faith. In the faith. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and was preached unto every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I hope that one day we can say again that the gospel has been re-preached among all those under the heavens. We've never lived in a day of which that couldn't be easier. But if you continue in the faith grounded and settled. What, what, what do we know about the faith? Where do I find it? What's in the scriptures? Who wrote it? Well, that's God. Who died for it? That's Jesus. Do you not see the importance about the faith? But look at the, there's an important word in Colossians 1.23. I would suggest to you the most important word of the passage. What is it? Colossians 1.23. Continues a good one. And, and I'll go ahead and tell you, I almost picked that as the most important word. If. It's conditional. You don't have to be faithful. You don't have to be a Christian upon this earth. But you're going to have to be one if you're going to be in eternity with Jesus. It's conditional. How many people do you know in your personal life who maybe in this very room walk down these aisles, went up those stairs, went down into the baptistry, and have never returned? Whether it be for a short period of time or whether it was a long period of time after they left, how many people do we know? We were like that rocky soil, as we read about in the book of Luke, or that soil that was covered in thorns that choked it out, a soil that was baked with the sun of which it was dried out. How many people do we know that are like that? Now, now listen, we are not soil specialists, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? We are not soil specialists. We should be cultivators, but we are not soil specialists. I better know what my soil is. You know, it's easier to be concerned about somebody else's soil than mine, isn't it? We have a faith that we can follow because we can, we can be grounded and settled in the faith. Has the seed been planted in your heart? We have a faith that we can follow. That will unite us together. What else will unite us together? Well, it is a look that we can live. This comes from Luke chapter six or Luke chapter nine, verse sixty-two. This is our ninth thing this morning. I want you to see what happens here, because Jesus is going to say something, and it's an illustration that well we get, we we understand this, just like we understand a sower went forth to sow the seed. We understand a man. Y'all get it? Humanity. We we get people. Now look at what Jesus says, no man. Now what does that mean? Well, what precedes this tells me that it can't happen. It, it's a negative beginning to it. No man having put his hand to the plow. How many of you have done that? We might say it this way, no man having put his hand to the tiller. That might be the modern way we would do that. You done that? You ever done that lately? That's right. Do we get it? There's a look that we can live. I was hoping one of our farming fellows would step up and just go at it. There you go. We, we don't live the Christian life like this. We might call it straddling the fence. Some call it sitting on the fence post. I like to call it sitting in the pew. Now, I'm not talking about you, but think about this. When we come just to get our Christianity and we just sit in the pew, we're looking back. He says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back. Now, listen to the rest of this. Is fit for the kingdom of God. 
What's he saying? Let's boil it down. No man who looks back is going to be where? No man who looks back is going to be where? Heaven. The phrase kingdom of God and heaven can in almost every occasion, almost every occasion, be used interchangeably. And we have a look that we can live. You remember what happened in the Old Testament? Someone who looked back. You're right. She did. There's one. Name me a second one. I'd forgotten about her. I wasn't thinking about her. Lot's wife. They were leaving Sodom and Gomorrah. What, what did God, or the, through the angel God, tell them to do? Don't look back. I, to a degree, understand why she looked. Don't you? Boy, it'd be hard to leave all your possessions. It'd be hard to leave everything you know. It would be hard to leave everything that you've built. I, I understand that, don't you? I tell you, every year that I go overseas, when I get to the airport, I look back. I'm not going this year due to the current climate of our world. But there's something important at home. I get that. But what about heaven? Is the world worth heaven? May I suggest to you it's not. Here's number 10. Things that unite the church. Number 10 from James chapter 1, verse 12. We have a crown that we can capture. This is what the writer says. He says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Guess what? How many of us is that? All of us are going to endure temptation, but how many of us will be blessed? Hopefully all of us. He says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord, listen to that, this is not something that we have promised, this is not something that those of old have promised, which the Lord hath promised to them, listen to this, that love him. Ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest to you that we have a crown that we can capture. Ten things we've looked at today to help us understand that the church can be united together. And guess what? Not a single one of these things that we've looked at reach us anywhere else except right here. Do you not see what unites the church together? It's right here. If we'll allow it, if we'll follow it. I appreciate your attention this morning. Uh, we will pick up, I think, I think I'm telling you right now, for the next three weeks, um, if not, you'll notice that, but next week we'll also have the entire class in the bulletin as well, and I appreciate you this morning with your kind attention. Thank you so much.